last year as he premiered People Speak. But last night, after Howard died, um, we saw the New York Times put up the AP, uh, the Associated Press obit. The Times is something like 1,200 obits already prepared for people. Um, they didn't have one prepared for Howard Zinn. And this Associated Press obit very quickly went to a quote of Arthur Schlesinger, the historian, uh, who uh, once said, I know, he's talking about Howard Zinn, I know he regards me as a dangerous reactionary, and I don't take him very seriously. He's a polemicist, not a historian. Naomi Klein, your response. I don't think that would have bothered Howard Zinn at all. He never was surprised when power protected itself. And, um, and he really was a people's historian, so he didn't look to the elites for a validation. Um, I'm just so happy that, that Anthony and the incredible team from, from People Speak gave Howard this incredible gift at the end of his life. I was, I was at Lincoln Center um, at the premiere of People Speak and was there when just the mention of Howard's name led thousands of people to leap to their feet and give him the standing ovation that he deserves. So I don't think he needed the New York Times. I don't think he needed um, the official historians. You know, he was, he was the, everybody's favorite teacher, the teacher that changed your life. But he was that for millions and millions of people. And so, you know, that's what happened. We, we just lost our favorite teacher. But the thing about Howard is that the history that he taught was, was not just about losing the official illusions about nationalism, about the, the, the heroic fi figures. It was about telling people to believe in themselves and their power to change the world. So like any, any wonderful teacher, he left all of these lessons behind. Um, and I think we should all just resolve to be a little bit more like Howard today. Well, let's end with Howard Zinn. Um, in his own words, from one of his last speeches, he spoke at Boston University just two months ago in November. No matter what we're told, no matter what tyrant exists, what border has been crossed, what aggression has taken place, it's not that we're going, to be, we're going to be passive in the face of tyranny or, or aggression, no. But we'll find ways other than war to deal with whatever problems we have. Because war is inevitably, inevitably, the indiscriminate massive killing of huge numbers of people. And children are a good part of those people. Every war is a war against children. Uh, so it's not just getting rid of <laughs> Saddam Hussein. Think about it. Well, we got rid of Saddam Hussein. In the course of it, we killed huge numbers of people who had been victims of Saddam Hussein. When you fight a war against a tyrant, who do you kill? You kill the victims of the tyrant. Anyway, all this, all this was simply to make us think again about war and, and to think you know, we, we, we're at war now, <laughs> right? In Iraq, in Afghanistan, and sort of in Pakistan, since we're sending rockets over there and killing innocent people in Pakistan. And uh, so we should not accept that. No, we should look for, an, look for a, a peace movement to join. Really, look for some peace organization to join. I mean, I, it will look small at first and pitiful and helpless, but that's how movements start. That's how the movement against the Vietnam War started. started with handfuls of people who thought they were helpless, thought they were powerless. But remember, this the power of the people on top depends on the obedience of the people below. When people stop obeying, they have no power. Now, when workers go on strike, huge corporations lose their power. When consumers boycott, huge business establishments uh, have to give in. When soldiers refuse to fight, as so many soldiers did in Vietnam, so many deserters, so many fraggings, acts of violence by enlisted men against officers in Vietnam, B-52 pilots refusing to fly bombing missions anymore, war can't go on. When enough soldiers refuse, uh, the government has to, has to decide we can't continue. So yes, uh, people have the power if they begin to organize, if they protest, 
and to create a strong enough movement, uh, they can change things. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Yes, that was Howard Zinn. As we wrap up today, Naomi Klein, your final words. Well. We are in the midst of a Howard Zinn revival. I mean, this was happening anyway, and it's so extraordinary for somebody at the end of their life to be having films made about them and played on television, and his books are back on the bestseller lists. And it's because the particular message that Howard relayed his whole life, devoted his whole life to, is so relevant for this moment. I mean, even thinking about it the day after the State of the Union address, Howard's message was don't believe in great men, believe in yourself. History comes from the bottom up. And and that we've, we have forgotten how change happens in this country. We think that you can just vote and the change will happen for us. And Howard was just relentlessly reminding us, no, you make the change that you want. And that message was so relevant for this moment. And I, I just feel so grateful to, to Anthony and once again the whole team that, 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 that facilitated this revival because we need Howard's voice more than ever right now. And of